with uh, one intruder. <laughs> but uh, the first speaker is Enrico Capellaro from the Gra Gravita Collaboration, ENAF Collaboration, and they will speak about uh, detection and many things. Okay, can you hear me? Good. Uh, I will uh, try to give you uh, some sort of lesson learned from uh, the event, the, the only one event we had so far of electromagnetic follow-up of a gravitational wave event. And uh, the first things, uh, uh, I start from the map of the uh, sky arrow map of the event which have been uh, triggered and uh, uh, what I want to know is that, that for optical people to, or for uh, follow-up things, it is easy to, to, to find this object if you know where to search and what to search. Uh, where to search, uh, I want to emphasize that is, uh, our search is in a volume, is not just in an area. So a constraint on distance is crucial. And indeed, it was the, this was the case for the event of August, because uh, by having a constraint on the distance, we could limit the number of galaxies where to search for transit to just 60 galaxies, more or less. And that was what makes all the difference. And of course, then uh, we also knew that we are looking for something in the range of magnitude of this sort that also helped. Uh, you know that after the trigger, there were activated many, many uh, telescopes around the world. Uh, uh, I will not speak uh, here of the part of the search of, for transients in the area because there are two talks, one by Lino Grado later on and one by Sheng Yan tomorrow, so they will talk about this. However, I will show one slide which shows that uh, the, the event uh, was detected independently by at least uh, six groups. So, Six group as an image of the same galaxy in, uh, say, a couple of hours, one or two hours from the first image. And uh, the conclusion is that if so many uh, groups were able to detect the transit independently, means that finding the object was uh, fairly easy. Uh, however, without the JVU trigger, it would not be found. The main reason is because it was the wrong observing season. The object was very close to the sun. It was in the uh, target list for many supernova search or other kind of searches, which in other uh, situations would have found independently the object. Not in this case, because it was too, it was, uh, went, in, it was, went out from the list of target for that observing season. Uh, when you detect one transient in the area, you need to know what it is because there are many, many transients, as we will see in the sky. And uh, the, the first spectrum which was obtained was not really conclusive of any sort. It looks like a normal collapse supernova uh, taken very early on. What makes the difference were the spectra taken uh, uh, in the next couple of days, and especially because uh, these spectra extend uh, quite far in, out of, in the infrared, out of the optical region, which is here. And you see that uh, what we can follow with this spectra is the evolution from, of, the, of the set, that is, this colored line. Uh, these are the kilonova, which move from year to year and do not look any more like a supernova. So it is for sure, a, a, it looks like a kilonova, we will see. Uh, what I want to stress here that uh, the point was that because of the small volume we had to search, there was basically only one real good candidate to, to look at. Whether this is typical or not, I will bet it's not typical. And uh, so in the next period, will, that distilling the good candidate among the many transients can become a critical point. Uh, when we identify this transient, uh, we, Europe, have access to a huge selection of instruments. This is only ISO, choice of uh, available instrumentation between Paranal and La Silla. Uh, 
So you can choose from visible, spectral resolution, polarimetry, whatever you want. But what made the difference was this single instrument, VLT plastic shooter. And uh, uh, this is unique. There are no other similar instrument around. And so we were very lucky to have a, a proven proposal to this single instrument. Otherwise, we would not be able to do what has been done. This is a one slide summary of what has been done in the optical and near, in near infrared, so light curves from many, many groups, as you see here, from a recent collection. Polarization measurement, which only show upper limits. And the, the sequence of spectra, which goes from uh, alpha day, this is the only one which came from uh, different uh, groups. All the other were made at ESO and the continue actually uh, until the object disappear uh, after a couple of weeks. What we learned from this object, from this spectra is that, uh, well, the obvious things, the, the temperature of the spectra is dropping down quite quickly from 11,000 degree to 3,000. This is a uh, rough black body uh, fit. It's clear that here is not a black body anymore, uh, but just to, to have an idea of the temperature. Uh, we have a measurement of the luminosity from the, 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 the light curve. And from these two things combined, uh, we, uh, temperature luminosity, we have the radius of the object. From the radius of the object, we, since we know when the, the expansion started, the time of the GV, we have a measure of the expansion velocity. Nothing, the physics inside is very little, and the expansion velocity comes out 0.3, the speed of light. So this is really a relativistic object. It's not the standard things. Uh, so the first things we want to understand is why we say that it is a kilonova. We do not, uh, so far there have been some uh, suggestion, but there is really no definite identification of any single element in the spectrum. Okay. So the, the only things we can do is to produce synthetic spectrum of different mixture of elements and see which one match better with the observed one. And uh, for instance, if we distinguish a standard iron dominated uh, um, ejecta with the lanthanide things, uh, we, we know from modeling that uh, in the case of iron, we, we have a peak in the optical in the blue or visual region. In the case of lanthanides, we should have expected a peak uh, in the infrared. And uh, the observed spectra, which is this blue line here, match, let's say, to me is uh, exceptionally well the, uh, uh, the model predicted before for lanthanide uh, emission. So the situation uh, is indeed uh, as I say, that the fit is, was even too good because the situation is actually very complex there. The model predicts that there are different regions with different composition, expansion velocity, direction of expansion, and depending on uh, uh, how much uh, the, um, the, what, what is the process that lead from the neutron star merging to, let's say, the final black hole, uh, how long it takes to the proto-neutral star to collapse to the black hole and so on, you will uh, observe different things. But what I, I want to stress is that the current model assumes spherical symmetry, local thermodynamic equilibrium, uniform abundances. None of these uh, is expected to be here, so the crude approximation. And uh, adding to that, uh, there is a huge uncertainty in the current atomic line list uh, for lanthanide elements. So it is a miracle that you have a fit of the observed spectrum to the um, uh, model. Still, uh, there have been a, a recent paper by Kazen, which published a list, uh, a grid of model for different uh, condition, which should, uh, in some sort of sense, represent a different component present in the, in the kilonova ejecta. Is we are here assuming that the component can sum up, which is not obvious, but let's take this approximation. And you see that if I take this, the, the colored line are the components, 
the black line are the observations. You take two components with, uh, which have a fairly reasonable um, parameter and you get uh, a very good fit. And the, the, if you move, uh, this is 4.5 day, if you go earlier on, the same two components, which are here, you see that you are missing something. So there is something else, another component, a blue one, that you need to fit the early spectra. All these things combined, I don't go in detail here, which is, takes long, but all these things combined uh, fit fairly well a model where there is a long-lived neutron star uh, after the merging, where long-lived is millisecond, but uh, is, uh, is long, let's say, for... So, I don't say that this is the right mo model, but the, 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 the things which you expect is very close to this. Uh, these things is, is important for astrophysics because uh, we knew that uh, we had a problem with elements uh, heavier than uh, iron or so on, the very heavy element. The blue elements here are produced by supernova mainly, and the yellow elements here were not produced in supernova in, in enough, let's say. There were few of them produced, but not enough. And the, the, the idea was that they could be produced in the very neutral rich environment, like in a kilonova merging. Uh, so if this is the case, if these elements were produced, the, we expected that the, the spectrum was dominated by lanthanides, because lanthanides have the higher uh, opacity, so the spectrum should be dominated, as we observe. The spectrum of the object is dominated by lanthanide. However, when you talk with the people, since uh, among these elements, uh, you, you need to think uh, what you want to, to talk about, you talk about gold, which is inside these things, but we, we, I do not expect anyone is ever able to see land, uh, uh, gold that is present there because of the, the line list is less uh, favorable, because expansion velocity is huge, so identify one single element will be really difficult. Anyhow, the conclusion is that uh, the kilonova produced uh, roughly the cosmic observed ratio of our process element. Between, if it is, is true, you expect there are 100 mass earth of gold, which is okay. The, uh, the, the point is that uh, all these conclusions rely on one thing. So you need to have optical near infrared daily spectroscopy which otherwise you will not be able to, to solve this um, ejecta structure. Uh, sometime later, 10 days, uh, something about that, you, uh, there is the emerging of X-ray from the remnant. This is uh, uh, something which will last much longer, as we will see, than the optical observation, the optical uh, light, let's say the optical light for the kilonova. The detection, first detection from X-ray was at nine day, and uh, then it, it grows in time, and this is consistent with two things. It can be uh, that uh, it is uh, off-axis uh, emission, which we, come, we come to see from a standard, let's say, GRB, uh, from a jet, or there is a more symmetric uh, cocoon emission. Uh, you talk with different people, they have different opinions, uh, a, a, um, a information on the same subjects comes from radio observation, which also uh, was detected sometimes later, uh, 16 days, the first observation, and uh, there were uh, uh, um, some observation, a prediction for future of this uh, emission. You see that the prediction looks very similar unless you look to the time scale which is these days, these years. So, I mean, they're rising and declining, but the time scale is, uh, it depends a lot from the environment uh, situation. Uh, so, when we close this observing, the observing season closed uh, in uh, mid-September, because the object went beyond the sand, and was going to appear again at the end of November. So, we, had, we are with some question to work uh, on the same object, which were uh, uh, 
uh, what is this GRB X-ray origin? Is the cocoon? Is a jet? Uh, geometry of the jet, and so on. There were new observations when the object came out. Uh, there were uh, at least four papers, if I have not missed some, um, which are observing X-ray in uh, with the XMM Newton with Chandra. Uh, we're observing uh, with HST in the near infrared and uh, with VLA. In all these cases, there are positive detection. Okay, I use a couple of figures to summarize uh, what is uh, found from these. You have that the, so these are the spectral energy distribution at the four epochs. This was nine days, 15, 110, and 160. You see that the optical, I mean, the, the straight line here means synchrotron emission. The, at the, early on, the, the optical was dominated by the kilonova, which is thermal, not um, synchrotron. At late phase, 110 days, everything fits very well on the synchrotron uh, spectrum. And if you look to the uh, evolution with time, there is an increasing uh, uh, luminosity from uh, um, in X-ray and radio. There is a decreasing in the optical because we had this before, which now it disappeared. But the conclusion you see is still not uh, that uh, definite because uh, the, the, I took this from the paper of uh, Marguti. The, the observation consisted in both uh, a quasi spherical ejecta, what is called a cocoon, and an off axis collimated ejecta, which is what you call eject. So we are still there. The questions are not yet solved. We probably. Uh, I hope we can solve uh, waiting uh, for some time. So, after that, uh, uh, what we want to do? We have one object, this kilonova of August. First things we want to learn from diversity, and there are some obvious, uh, in, 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 the first uh, parameter we want to verify was that and is what happens if you have different binary mass, and especially in this case, what happens if we have a different viewing angle, which is going to dominate the about observation. Then, uh, of course, we will, I think we will continue to ask ourselves, is it really true that in black hole, black hole merging, we have zero emission? That will not be zero. We will need to search very deep to find something, uh, or we need to be very lucky to have a, a black hole, black hole merger at short distance. We hope, I mean, here we need even more luck. We need to have a possibly a nearby, very nearby supernova. In that case, it would be interesting to search for emission from there. Uh, in all these cases, we want to, to work out statistics to reconcile the GV events rates with the astrophysical scenario. Where are these binary systems coming from? Do we have the proper mass ratio and so on? So looking to what we, as a say, astronomical community, we uh, uh, are looking for the next O3. That is, was O2, uh, where we had some uh, forecast for what kind, for what was the expected number of events, and this is what has been found. And you see that for neutron star, neutron star, we are at the upper end of what was expected. Uh, for uh, black hole, black hole, we are at the lower end. Uh, if we extrapolate this to the O3, we can, and we assume that the, the kilonova we observed is typical, we may observe quite a few tens of the neutron star and neutron star events. Uh, we have expect a huge number of black hole, black hole merging, but uh, if we want really to search for faint emission, let's say that we want to constrain to event within 100 megaparsec, that's need to, to have uh, lots of luck. For supernova, it's even more difficult. What distance we can see a supernova depends on many things, but let's say pessimistic is 5 kiloparsec, optimistic, very optimistic is 5 megaparsec. How many objects there are there? Uh, it is uh, one supernova every three years in five kiloparsecs, in megaparsecs, sorry. But if you want to, do, to see the supernovae which are really expected to produce some strong asymmetry, the collapser type, then you may need to wait 300 years, which is, uh, you need some luck. 
Uh, however, here astronomers can help, can help if we can provide accurate time of explosion for the nearby event. So our commitment is to uh, derive accurate time of explosion for all events within five megaparsec, and then we will search and see if there is some signal on the GV data. So facilities, uh, uh, last few uh, uh, slides on the facilities. For O3, the facility will remain, the available facility will remain the one we were using in O2. Uh, possibly for ENAF, we will have a, a much more dedicated use of the Sardinia radio telescope, which was only partly uh, available at uh, O2. All the other things are, are available. There is, uh, however, an attempt to organize the European community for a joint proposal at ESO VLT. It's not obvious that the as Italian community will gain from that because the other time we were the only one player in, the, in this game and next time we will have to, but, oh no, that is the game. So the, the, the attempt going on right now is to have a joint proposal for all instruments, all units of the VLT telescope. That will be, scientifically, will be great. We also think that we need to invest in, in, in the problem of uh, how to select the good candidate among uh, the possibly many, many, many transients which are there, uh, found uh, by the search. And this is why we have been pursuing since, since a couple of years, we are following this uh, um, uh, idea to build an instrument, which is, this, this is uh, being approved by ESO, is an instrument which is a, a copy of the X-shooter, so an optical near-infrared spectrograph, which, however, will be mounted at a smaller size telescope, not the 80 meter, a 4 meter telescope NTT, which, however, will be available basically all the time. That means that we can use this to distill the interesting candidates that then can go on the you choose one and you go to the VLT for the follow-up. Uh, on the longer time scale, one instrument which is going to play a, a major role is JWST because it is an infrared, mid-infrared instrument in space. It can go much, much deeper than anything we can think on the ground. So if you want to search for very distant kilonova, that would be of course, it is heavily subscribed and very difficult to assess, but there are proposals to, do, to use these instruments. Uh, the, some year later, you are, we are working and waiting for the LSST, which uh, will have uh, is a 8.4 meter optical telescope with a huge field of view. Look here, it is going to provide 10 million transient uh, every night, okay? So, uh, so the, the problem here is not to search a transient, to, to know which one is the right transient among these things. Uh, I think that still we don't have a real, an idea of what to deal with this. But uh, 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 let's say that instrument like the uh, uh, SOX, an instrument like that, we will need many of them, as I will say uh, in a minute. And on even longer time scale, uh, ENAF is working on uh, four main enterprises, which is ELT, the optical uh, near-infrared next generation 39 meter mirror, CTA, with a big commitment for very high energy uh, uh, by ENAF, SKA, the square kilometer uh, array, uh, and uh, some mission in the X-ray, which is Tesio Seatina. The Tesio is smaller, Lorenzo, just because it's a medium size, and Atina is a large size, not, not, not other. <laughs> but uh, uh, on Tesio, we will be speaking uh, Lorenzo in a while. And uh, this will give uh, lots of opportunity for following uh, at the very extreme object. But I want to conclude uh, with uh, a comment, which is uh, because of expected number of trigger, a network of dedicated, flexible, small scale facility are needed to distill the target that then can go to the highly oversubscribed facility. And this is a problem because it's very difficult to convince 
financing agency and so on, that you need a small telescope distributed around. It's much easier to build a, a huge facility. Still, if without, without these things, it will be difficult to exploit all the science. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. There is room for questions. Are there questions? I have a question of Corbent. The question is easy, it may be a stupid question, but can you exclude the final product of uh, the Savit Nero A17 to be a neutral star from uh, optical and no. near infrared? I don't think there is a, a proof of that, no. Okay. Uh, the, the comment is that uh, <clears throat> the idea to have a 20 to 40 degree offset uh, uh, scenario for this gamma ray burst is also coming from the prompt. Uh, because basically on energetic uh, yeah. uh, that seems to data, work. That seems to work. I mean, surely we are not, we, we haven't seen that the, the, the directly in the cone and nor to, to sideways. I agree. Other questions? Yeah. Would it be useful for O3 and O4? You least? will have a talk later on. on yes. this. <laughs> Yeah, in a minute we will, uh, we'll have a discussion of that. Naive question for a non-astronomer. I mean, uh, at which range uh, are, do you think that it would be um, efficient to make use of information in galaxy, galaxy catalogs? I mean, I, I, I hear a lot of colleagues saying, look, we will improve our uh, maps. <laughs> and uh, uh, by use of galaxy catalog, but are they reliable beyond 50 megaparsec, 100 megaparsec? Uh, they are incomplete, for sure. At the 100 megaparsec current catalog have uh, completeness, say, I don't know, 50%. Okay, and uh, uh, worse and worse when you go at higher distance. Uh, uh, even if you don't have a galaxy catalog, you still can classify galaxy and Bayesian shape on your image. And this is a way to select interesting candidates, which is often used. You, you think that the kilonova will occur in a galaxy. You think, that, well, you know, you need to, do, to select something. So the first, uh, the first selection is done. Is an object near a galaxy? The galaxy do not need to be in a catalog. We can use the, the same image to say that uh, the nearby object is a galaxy. But, uh, you know, you may also expect some isolated... Uh, binary interstar in empty space. That's, there were supernovae, a few. We can learn from supernova, I think, is this mostly the same phenomena in some respect. Most, 99%, uh, I would say, of the supernovae were in galaxy. A few, a few, I would say 10, not more than that, were found too distant from the galaxy, from any galaxy. So there were some uh, in what we call interstellar space, intergalactic space. Yeah, so. The last one. You mentioned the large number of data that will be available soon. Uh, this poses also a problem of optimization of the software. Uh, what's going on, what's, what is going on from this point of view? Uh, there is a, there are many groups working on that, uh, especially in the, cost, in the context of uh, LST. In the coastal LST, there are many working groups trying to deal. Uh, I must admit I'm still skeptical of what will come out because it is very easy to find out, to select objects that you know what they are. So you want to take out from LST the type 1A supernova, a redshift 0.5, easy. You want to search for something that you do not really know how it looks like, almost impossible at the moment. So, I think that, especially if it is a very rare object, because, you know, you do cluster analysis, machine learning, but that works on numbers. If you have one, two rare objects, they will uh, not fit in any place. So we need to, the only way is that between now and LST, we learn more about what the kilonova looks like, so we are able to confine the, the parameter space. Okay, thank you, Enrico.